Very good afternoon. I'm Aisha and I will be your host for today's webinar. Kindly note that this webinar will be recorded. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our monthly Actress Cell Therapy Lecture Series. Today's lecture focuses on cultured epithelial autographs, clinical applications and optimizing the cell culture system. Let's welcome Associate Prof. Elvin Chua, our distinguished speaker for today's webinar. Clinical Associate Professor Elvin Chua is an Assistant Director, Transplant Research and Principal Investigator of the Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery Research Laboratory in Singapore General Hospital. He has 20 years of skin cell culture and tissue banking experience, having been previously trained in Switzerland, the USA and Australia. He is also currently the Regulatory and Compliance Lead for SingHealth Duke NUS Cell Therapy Center, as well as Assistant Director of the Transplant Tissue Center, SingHealth, where he is responsible for the operations, quality assurance, and research of tissue transplantations for skin cardiovascular tissues and iliac vessels. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A window. Dr. Sadiq Cho and Prof. Chua will address these questions after the presentation. So without any further ado, I will hand the time over to Prof. Chua. Prof. Chua, please. Prof. Chua, please unmute yourself. You're currently muted. Thank yeah, you. can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Are you clear? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction and also to Atris for giving me this platform to share with all of you our work over the years. So I will be presenting on the clinical applications of cultured epithelial autographs or CEA for short, and also how we optimize the cell culture system for CEA over the years to serve patients better. So hopefully I can convince all of you the value of our work as we need all the reg regulatory and development support to navigate within this new, exciting and blossoming cellular therapy environment in Singapore today. Okay, so let me first of all refresh everyone on the wonder of our skin. So it is considered the largest organ that covers up to 20,000 centimeters square of body surface area on an average adult. Okay. And as we all know, it gives us the protective, perceptive, regulatory, and cosmetic function, which we often time take for granted. Prochar, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Please share your screen, your slides. Oh, yep. sorry, I, I haven't shared yet. Is it? Yes. I, I thought it was shared. Sorry. Uh. No problem, it's okay. There's the share screen button at the bottom there. Can you see now? Yes, you can see it now. Can you see the whole screen? Yes. Okay, sorry about it. Yes, I didn't know. No I thought problem. just now during the rehearsal, yeah. when we went through the site, I thought it was already up there. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry about that. It's okay. We can see it yep. now. We can continue. Can you see now? You. Yep, yep. Okay, so this is the slide as I was talking about the largest organ, yes. the all the different functions that uh, we typically take for granted. Okay, so you can see the skin structure here, which is very complex. All right, so. Uh, just continue. So our skin contains a wide variety of cell types that make a complex and yet well-organized um, tissue architecture. So the skin is composed of two major layers, the epidermis and the dermis, which are separated by the basement membrane here shown in blue. So the epiderm epidermis is actually very complex with multi-layered stratified epithelium that's made up majority of uh, keratinocyte cells. Okay, and it's maintained by the proliferation of epidermal stem cells located at the basal layer here, and the progressive differentiation to form the spinous, granular, and terminally differentiated straightened corneum. So the hair follicle and the sweat glands, um, as well as the sebaceous glands, okay, are all part of the skin system. Okay, and then the dermis, Okay, you have the thinner papillary dermis and the thicker reticular dermis. Okay, 
So the dermis is populated by essentially fibroblasts, uh, the sensory nerves, blood vessels, adipocytes, and immune cells. So basically reciprocal communication between the epidermal and dermis cells play a very critical role in skin development, hemostasis, uh, sorry, hemostasis, regional differences and physiological differences and functions. So there are many types of injuries to our skin resulting in various wounds, as you can see here in the figure. So what I'm going to introduce here, okay, is more about burns, traumatic wounds caused by extreme heat, okay, which lead to deep dermal or full thickness burns. So basically, the full layer of skin, which you saw just now, is injured, okay, which means that the protective function Okay, that protects us from all the pathogens in the environment no longer works. And so um, patients succumb to infection, which can be life-threatening. So typically, burn surgeon will have to quickly excise all these burn tissues that are non-viable to a clean and healthy bed. And this, is, this will be followed by harvesting of their own healthy skin graft, we call autographs, to be placed over the injured area. Okay. Typically, this will be done for patients with burn injury of total body surface area of 30% and below. So, but what if the patient has major burn injuries of more than 50% and with full thickness burns? Okay, there might not be sufficient harvest site on the body to get healthy skin to treat the injury. So, because of this big problem, that's led to the birth of skin tissue engineering. All right, so... On the left, we have Professor Howard Green and James Greenwald, of which they came up with the epidermal component, which is the cellular part, which later I'm going to cover quite a fair bit on, and also the dermal component, which are typically acellular. So, so if you can see here, okay, um, based on the research by um, the previous researchers, okay, culture epithelial autograph or the cultured cells. Okay, from the epidermis has been used to treat burns in the 80s. At the same time, a cellular dermal matrix were also used to treat uh, severe burns, okay, more as um, to give the dermal support before you either use cultured epithelial autograph or very thin piece of the healthy skin over to reach a proper closure. So with, you know, the invention of those two products in the 70s and 80s, okay, it spawned a lot of several other tissue engineered products till now. So on the left, you can see are basically the cellular biological, okay? So basically it's either a single layer of keratinocytes, which is represented by KC, or it comes in combination with FB, which is skin fibroblast. So now the most advanced tissue skin, the tissue engineered product are just bilayered skin. And now people are trying to incorporate endothelial cells, blood vessels into this tissue engineered product. On the right, we have the acellular, synthetic, uh, biosynthetic, and tissue derived dermal template. Typically, these are derived from animals, bovine, ovine, or porcine sources. And they are used more as dermal matrix, as a support to treat deep burns, and also as artificial skin substitute to treat more superficial burns. So here in uh, SGH, okay, we use in-house uh, so-called cellular biological or keratinocytes. And on the right, these are some of the commercial products that we are currently using. Okay, so um, since just now I was talking about Professor Howard Green, okay, there was a very um, deep review on his work in terms of his cell culture technology uh, quite recently in 2017. So basically, you can see that in the 70s, he came up culturing keratinocytes and also looking at this stem cell population. And then he went on for uh, to be translated to treat burns okay, in the 80s. And in the uh, late 1990s, it was used to culture uh, limbo stem cells to restore vision in uh, corneal defects. And that was also followed by uh, improvement to all um, the substrate to, to so-called uh, deliver these skin epithelial cells or these epithelial cells to the wound site uh, 
uh, more easily and more readily. Okay, and finally, it actually led to this landmark study, which is the regeneration of the entire epidermis using uh, transgenic cells, okay, or transgenic keratinocytes, okay, to restore this uh, very severe blistering condition called uh, junctional epidermolysis verrucosa. So in our burn center, we are fortunate to also to adopt Harvard Green's method through the pioneering effort of Professor STD shown here. Uh, he was a HOD of plastic then in the 80s. He visited Prof Green, who was then in Harvard, who after that went to Harvard. All right. So he sent Prof Yen Berenden, who is also a big professor in his own right now, in the late 80s to set up our skin culture program. So below you can see our first screen, uh, sorry, first piece of cultured skin in the early 1990s. Okay. So with all this pioneering effort, okay, I'm glad that our SGH burn center has this additional armamentarium at our disposal to treat major burn injuries. So, and upon building this pioneering effort since the uh, 90s, with the local um, clinical evaluation of CEA, okay, the skin cultures, uh, the skin culture uh, so-called team also worked to improve the delivery of CEA over the years. First, by culturing keratinocytes on uh, approved synthetic um, wound dressings. These are transparent so we can observe the growth and deliver onto the wound bed. And finally, we also um, use this transparent finer, uh, sorry, transparent fibrin carrier. Okay, and we are the first in Asia to use this, and which have which we have been used until now to treat severe burn patients. So basically, in this study, we have to ensure that the use of this fibrin mat does not compromise the regenerative uh, epithelial cells in culture. So you can see these plates here. Okay, they are actually called colony forming efficiency plates, which we only see 100 to 200 cells. And if they form nice colonies like what you see here, it just means that our CA that's cultured, okay, and the material that's being used is conducive for the epidermal stem cells for grafting and eventual engraftment. So this is um, our one of the cases that I want to share with you that how we use CA on full thickness burns after skin allografting. So again, you can see that we actually have these CP, CE plates always in, cultured in parallel to our CEA culture because we need to know the quality of our CEA before grafting. Okay, so typically we use a two-stage process. We first uh, will graft with an allodermis. Okay, again, as I said, to give the support for the epithelial cells followed by the CEA grafting. So all these were at the back uh, all this work were done at the back of uh, works previously reported by Cluno and Hickinson in the 80s and 90s. Okay, so I'm just going to go a bit more in-depth into how we do it. So when there is a big severe burns, okay, in this case, this guy has is a 45% total body, has to, uh, sorry, 45% total body surface area burn injury. And his left thigh okay, has full thickness burns after a motorcycle, a motorcycle explosion. Okay, so first we will get the skin allograft and cover over the wound bed that will be that will have to be excised to a clean, healthy layer. Okay, then we will put on the skin allograft as shown here. Okay, next we will actually wait for the dermal vascularization that will take place for up to two to three weeks while we take a small skin biopsy and culture the CA uh, for also about the same time so that you'll be ready for grafting later. All right, so once the dermal element is vascularized, okay, and the CA is ready, okay, um, what the surgeon will do, he will remove the epidermal layer of the skin allograft because the epidermal layer of the skin allograft is highly immunogenic and it will be rejected anyway. All right. So upon removal of the epidermal layer, we will put on the CA onto the wound bed like this. All right. So in this gentleman's case, okay, you can see engraftment took place quite quickly within a week, right, as evident from the pinkish appearance shown here at dressing takedown. 
at one week. And the wound bed went on to recover in about a month's time. Okay, next, I would also like to share with you a recent rare case of an extensive aplasia cutis congenita, which together with our neonates colleagues published in the case report, uh, in this case report in BMJ last month. So at birth, this baby had 37 total body surface area devoid of skin affecting her scalp, her trunk, and then her forelimbs. All right, so same thing here, we adopt a two-stage process to treat her defects. But here we use a uh, tissue engineer as a cellular dermal matrix for her instead of a skin allograph, which might be too immunogenic for her. All right, and uh, again, for this case, even taking a small skin biopsy to culture for this baby was also deep to extravagant in a sense because really she has very limited skin to culture as well. So as you can see uh, in this slide, we used the, we put on the acellular dermal matrix or ADM at, uh, at her day three of life on the scalp area as well as the trunk area. Okay, and once it's vascularized, we actually put on the cultured cells. Again, you can see we have the plating efficiency to ensure that the quality of the CA is there. Okay, uh, this was um, grafted on three months later, actually, because this was the second application, because the first application didn't take well. But you can see at the fifth month, okay, there was full engraftment, both on the scalp area as well as the trunk area. Okay, so um, in this slide, I just want to draw your attention to the engraftment on the scalp area of this baby. Okay, it's not as spectac uh, spectacular as what you saw at the burn patients where, you know, after one week, Okay, there was in fact almost 100% engraftment on the, on the injury. In this case, for this baby, the cells only engrafted within a small area, just like a small island in the middle of the scalp area. Okay, so you can see as time progresses, you can see this small area of engrafted cells actually become bigger. You can see here, at day 84, okay, it, it was coming down and joining and merging with the creeping epithelization from the sur surrounding of her wound, all right? So you can see eventually this whole um, defect was closed up uh, at day 114. So what I want to draw your attention to is that um, CA might not work as well on uh, a cellular uh, uh, so-called dermal template because there's a lack of um, basal membrane, unlike the skin allograph, okay, even though you remove the epidermis, there are still remnants of the basement membrane or these proteins there to facilitate engraftment. Okay, so um, basically I asked a lot, of, I, I've been asked a lot of questions, how effective CAA are, okay? So do they engraft? I, show, I hope I've shown you some of those cases uh, which can convince you. Do they generate? So you can see on this baby that it was slowly regenerating, okay? Even from a very small patch to a, to a big patch here, you can see. And whether they are stable over time, we still do not know. And uh, as we continue to monitor this uh, baby. And now maybe let me also share another case to maybe address the issue about the long-term stability of CA. So this lady went for a gut surgery but ended up with a dehiscent wound of which the general surgeon couldn't close up. And we were also unable to harvest her own skin graft due to a bleeding disorder. And, and so we opted to use CA with, without the use of dermal template. Okay, here we use, instead we use a vacuum therapy to prepare the wound bed to get a good granulating tissue before we graft the CAA on the wounds. Okay, so here we cover with skin allograft as a form of biological dressing. And here again, you see at three weeks, we do not see the spectacular graft tape like what you saw in the burn patient. But thankfully, the patient, um, the surgeons were patient. And at six weeks, you could see the pinkish appearance coming out to show that there is engraftment taking place. And so at six months, you can see that generally the whole wound defect was close up. 
And in fact, at, uh, at one and a half years later, we took a small punch biopsy and do uh, plating efficiency to see whether you know, um, the cells taken from the wound, def wound defect, which are from base, we are essentially from the CEA, whether they have, still have the regenerative properties. And you can see that uh, the, C the CPE uh, numbers were very good. In fact, the, the colonies were even better than the healthy skin that have taken initially. And if you can see at six years, okay, even pigmentation came back and the skin was very stable with no breakdown. So just to answer the, all the questions that have always been asked, do CA and graft, yes, on allodermis, on ADM, and even on, on momentum, which has no native skin appendages. So this is because this is evident from the extensive area treated by the CA, which are too big even for creeping epitalization to come from the site to heal the wound. All right. And next, do they gen, uh, regenerate? Yes. Although the skin is thinner and without hair, sweat glands, and sebaceous, and sebaceous glands. So basically what they give is the barrier function. And three, are they stable over time? Yes, from the many burn patients we have followed up and as demonstrated from the six year follow up of the, of the patient with the widely dehiscent abdomen. So over the years, we have been refining the use of CA to improve engraftment, especially on infected wounds with the use of micrografting and widely masked skin autograft, which I'm not going into details. We have also fully treated um, wounds secondary to pupillar fulminance in an infant, a hematological emergency occurring mostly in kids and in which there is skin necrosis and disseminated intravascular coagulation. So despite the good results you have seen with CA using Green's method, there are still limitations with the use of this technology. Firstly, it's only restricted to life-saving and autologous purpose, such as major burns and life-threatening skin defects, which are imposed on also present biotech companies. Vericell, okay, uh, JTAC, and Tigo Science, using conventional Green's method to produce CAs are all currently being restricted to only um, life-saving cases. Okay, this is because regulators such as the FDA have classified this conventional CEA as xenograft because the soy, if I may use that as an analogy, that's currently used to grow the human skin cells is a mouse feeder layer called the 3D3 cells. So now may I draw, you, draw your attention to the figure here below to help you appreciate this undesirable conventional cell I'm talking about. Okay, um, okay, so as you can see, um, there's these uh, epithelial cells, okay, they are all colonies. They are dancing and moving around in a sea of mouse fibroblasts as they proliferate and grow and become confluent. Okay, so once they are confluent, okay, we will graft them onto the injured wound bed. Okay, so as I was trying to answer the question in response to the impending um, tighter regulatory oversight on cell therapy in Singapore, okay, to see if, if there's anything that I can replace um, the mouse feeder cells, I stumbled upon these two papers, okay, of which uh, it was reported that the laminin could be used to replace also mouse feeder cells that are also that are being used to culture human pluripotent stem cells. Okay, so these two papers came out from Karolinska and, um, you know, I was even thinking that uh, how can I um, so-called collaborate with the person, uh, you know, with these two groups, I mean, with this group, okay. And uh, the other thing was also that I also found out that laminins are also implicated uh, in skin function, okay. So laminins are known to be... Um, involved in hair follicle development and adult hair cycle, in uh, wound healing, and also in dermal, epidermal junction adhesion. Otherwise, genetic skin blistering will occur. And so if you notice, actually, the principal investigators of all these studies is Professor uh, Carl Tregerson. 
actually he all this work was done in Karolinska and and I think you know we we're very fortunate that he actually came to Singapore joined Duke NUS and was right at our doorstep that I could just easily collaborate with him and with the introduction by Prof STD again incidentally so um, we started the collaboration of using this uh, specialized laminin asking the question whether it can do the same for skin keratinocyte cultures. Okay, so what are laminins? So laminins are a large uh, heterotrimeric uh, multi-domain proteins that consist of three chain. You have the alpha, beta, and gamma chain. There are at least 16 combinations of such trimers that have been identified in mammals. Okay. Uh, laminins have multiple, often cell type specific functions in processes such as adhesion, differentiation, migration, and phenotype maintenance. Okay, and it is also a key component of the skin basement membrane. And so it was been it has been reported uh, in 2006 that a single point mutation in the laminin of uh, just beta 3 chain will impair the entire assembly of the laminin 3 to 2. All right. So basically, the known laminins that are known to be in the skin, okay, are laminin 332 and laminin 511. Okay, so um, the first part of our work was really to re to relook at the skin, uh, human skin, okay, to check for what are the um, laminin expression um, that are within, okay. So, and we also at the same time look at the 3T3 mouse feeder cells to see exactly if there are any laminins that are also implicated in maintaining the stem cell population of these epidermal cells. Okay, so um, through our characterization, immuno, using immunofluorescence, RNA sequencing, and also Q, uh, PCR, we found that laminin 332, 322, 521, and 511 are expressed in the human skin basement membrane. And laminin 411 and laminin 421 are expressed in the mouse feeder cells. We also screen the various uh, laminin isoform coatings to test which is the best for culturing primary skin um, epithelial uh, cells. And we found that laminin 511 and laminin 421 were the best candidate, candidates for supporting keratinocyte growth using a serum free and chemically defined. Uh, medium from Lonza that potentially can be translated to clinical usage quickly. And as part of the screening, we also use different basal and different differentiation epidermal stem cell markers, uh, sorry, epidermal cell markers to check that laminin 511 and laminin 421 can culture prol proliferative and regenerative keratinocyte more consistently, as you can see here. Okay, and so basically you can see that all the cells are uh, expressed highly for basal markers and express uh, uh, there's a negligible expression of uh, differentiation markers. Okay, so we also went on to characterize uh, the human skin epithelial cells culture on the two laminin combination uh, using the mouse 3 3 cells as a positive control. So basically you can see that uh, the similar uh, growth characteristics based on population doubling is up to 30 population doubling, good colony forming efficiency with high expression of basal cells um, and low expression of differentiation markers at low passages. We also did karyotyping on the skin epithelial cells using the tree system and found no evidence of chromosomal abnormalities or translocation even at high passages. Next, um, we also seeded the human skin keratinocytes cultured on the tree system on an allodermis impregnated with viable skin fibroblasts to induce epidermal differentiation in an organotopic culture. So all three systems were able to produce normal and fully stratified epidermis um, as independently assessed by a pathologist. So again, you can see here, okay, we, we use all the different basal and differentiation markers to ensure that the expressions of the um, epidermal layer is of a fully stratified form. 
Finally, we also perform an in vivo functional assay on the flat of a new mice okay, to test for engraftment of these cultures produced on the clinical fibrin map you saw earlier, okay, comparing the three different culture systems. Okay. So basically, we use this flat model to protect the CEA from being disrupted. So in this case, okay, the fibrin map is put upside down beneath the flat and the stratification is um, so-called moving, growing towards the thoracic wall, as you can see here. Okay, it's going downwards. Okay, so um, at two weeks, okay, we sacrificed the animal, and we found very good um, stratification and engraftment of the cultured cells. So you can see um, between all these three system, there's full uh, stratification from the flat. All right from these three um, so-called uh, enlarged pictures. Okay. We also use KU80 as an anti-human nuclei stain to confirm that the grafted epithelial cell sheet is of human origin, as you can see in this uh, green stain here. Okay, these uh, figures also um, just show our more in-depth characterization of the engrafted uh, skin graft. Again, you can see all these all there upside down. So you can see all the basal cells have taken beneath the flat. Okay. So KRT15, KRT10, uh, sorry, KRT14, all these are basal cell markers. Okay. They are all attached to the base of the flat. And I, I can see at the lower region, where it's the more stratified layer, you can see the involucrine as well as the flagarine. Okay. That is all highly expressed. Okay. So again, we use KU80 to ensure that um, they are all really of human origin. And in fact, we also found that laminin was also deposited by the cultured cells. Okay, so... Um, let me uh, get real. Okay, so um, in 2015, it was also reported that a cell motion predicts the human epidermal stemness. Okay, so in our hands, when we culture keratinocytes on laminin 421, it also actually um, rotate very quickly, uh, which might suggest that um, um, there is stem cells, okay, um, being, uh, so that they are being maintained on this laminin uh, 421. So, um, so we are grateful that um, this laminin work that I presented to you or shared earlier, uh, were accepted and published. But uh, what is more important is that um, the, there is also further validation of our work by independent groups um, after the report, after our report showing that the decrease in laminin 511 in the basement membrane due to prolonged uh, photoaging that reduces epi epidermal stem cells. Okay, uh, in one part of their investigation, this Japanese group shows that. Um, the epidermal stem cells were maintained in the presence of a recombinant 511 using a stem cell marker called MCSP. So uh, maybe just to summarize um, our result, okay, um, our characterization with uh, laminin 511 and laminin 421 show that these two isoforms produce high quality and functionally competent cultured skin when compared against the use of mouse feeder cells in terms of a robust long-term culture of keratinocytes, high colony forming efficiency. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get a laser pointer. Full regeneration of the entire dermis on organotopic cultures, as well as on a new mice flat model. Okay. And the competitive advantage of using this lamp, uh, identified laminin isoforms are as follows. Firstly, uh, it's safer with no animal components. Secondly, it is safer, as you can see in the illustration uh, process of uh, skin manufacturing. The preparation, okay, is only a two-step process with an overnight coating using off-the-shelf laminins. Whereas if you are using the traditional method, you need up to five steps because you need to prepare the mouse feeder cells, okay, firstly from a cell bank, you have to grow it, harvest, and even irradiate the cells before you can seed 
the human skin keratinocytes to grow the keratinocytes. Okay, so um, this will improve productivity. Basically, we have calculated that it can give up to 90% in reduction in terms of manpower and manufacturing time. And the, this reduced overheads and compliant costs will actually also uh, reduce um, the investment that we have to put into this culture. Okay, so now um, we are preparing for our first in human clinical trial using this laminin system for burns. Uh, but in the process of doing this, we really underestimated the, the quality requirements needed to transit from a research to a GMP settings, having to dummy proof all processes. Uh, we have to put in much uh, in process controls and product release uh, specifications. The paperwork and SOPs are tremendous. And once we make any changes to deal with, say, for example, the contamination issues, we almost have to start everything from scratch for all the revalidation work and SOPs. Um, it is painful, but I think it's necessary. So as one of my overseas uh, skin banking counterpart mentioned, safety is not expensive, it is priceless. So based on the timeline shown here, we really hope we can start the clinical trial by the second half of this year. Okay, And if the trial is proven to be successful, we hope we can have a wider reach of, of this laminin-based CA as a safer product without animal components, sorry, um, without animal components, um, where we can use for less severe burns and chronic wounds. Okay, then we also want to also expand this platform um, in terms of cell culture technology for other epithelial cells, such as cornea or oral epithelial cells, okay, for other regenerative uh, medicine uh, applications. Okay, so with that, um, I just want to acknowledge all my mentors, my research team and funding support. And uh, I thank you for listening and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Prof. Chua. We will now proceed with the Q&A session. Please welcome our moderator, Dr. Sadiq Tovari, a senior research fellow in NCCS and also the acting head of strategic development and communications in Actress. Dr. Sadiq Tovari will assist us to read out um, all the questions. So Dr. Sadiq Tovari, please. Uh, Aisha, can I uh, help to take over from here to facilitate the Q and A session? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Alvin, thank you very much for this very uh, elaborate presentation on your work over the past many years. Right, uh, I think the first question that we have, right, is: uh, Is it crucial for the allografts to also develop skin adnexal structures such as sebaceous and sweat glands, and are there any efforts directed towards it? Yeah, okay, uh, thank you for that question. So basically, um, the skin allograph, while they have all the appendages, but when we use it as a, um, as a kind of template, eventually all this will be lost because um, this, is, this will not be part of the patient, right? Because they are immunogenic. So um, what we use this skin allograph is only as more as a dermal template for the vascularization to give us a a so-called healthy wound bed before we use the cultured cells over. So basically that's it. So we, we, we would not have all those um, structures as you have mentioned, such as sebaceous skin and sweat glands. So in fact, most of our burn patients, they have to live with this kind of defect. And so oftentimes they, they age a lot. Yeah. Thanks Alvin. Um... At this point in time, I don't see any further questions uh, from our audience members, and I think we still have a, a bit more time left. So uh, with the, some of the background knowledge that I have of your work, so maybe I will ask you a couple of questions specifically towards your new conventional, the new method that you have been developing that you shared uh, with Laminins, right? Um, would you like to uh, give a bit of an overview with our audience members who are, of course, interested in cell therapy, right? That how how is a journey of developing a cell therapy product out from discovery and then bringing it all the way for the process development stage that you have achieved so far? 
what were some of your key challenges, you know, um, and, and any advice that you may want to share with the community here? Yeah, so um, it was really an eye opener for me to move, you know, as what I've shared earlier, from the research uh, arena to um, so-called the clinical, I mean, I would say not clinical to the GMP manufacturing arena. So I, um, I think very critically is you have to make sure that whatever reagents that you are using, even at the research stage, okay, um, that you have to try and keep it so that you need not do any adjustment or changes along the way. Because if you do any, if you tweak any um, so-called component or any parts to your uh, cell culture process, as I mentioned earlier, you have to really revalidate everything from scratch, you know, and you, you will not be able to use it in a sense. And so, um, in fact, my project seems to be a very simple project because it's only involved coating of laminins. And so Carl, who is my collaborator, has always been asking me, why is it that it's taking so long? But we really underestimated the, the kind of quality assurance, as I mentioned, that's needed. All right, so as an example, Previously, we did not really use any antibiotics for our research work. And now because somehow that we are facing more contamination issues, we have to put in gentamicin as part of our protocol. And so we have to restart everything in a sense and to ensure that we can get the consistency in terms of culturing the skin, uh, the CEA, before we can use it on patient. So it's very important to plan ahead right at the onset. Thanks, Arvind. Thank you very much. Uh, and maybe I could use this opportunity to highlight one more point to our audience member before we go to the next question, is that as you discover your new cell therapy assets, right, uh, start to engage regulatory authorities, uh, manufacturing uh, partners, and as well as your clinical partner to get many of these process validation, process development, optimization work right from the very beginning, because this will really save you a lot of time, effort, cost, as you go down into the later stages of your clinical trial. So um, maybe a bit of a uh, advertisement for actress, please do speak to us, you know, as you start to work with your cell therapy projects, and we'll be happy to, you know, take some of these uh, discussions with you and help you guide through. Alvin, uh, with that, I'll move to the next question. What is the proliferation efficiency of epithelial cells uh, growing on laminin versus your mouse feeder? Okay, so typically, um, if you grow on the mouse feeder, if you take from a primary culture, that means on a skin tissue, um, it will take about seven, about seven to 10 days to grow. So uh, using laminins, uh, the difference is not that much different, but sometimes it might take a little bit longer. So maybe you can you need you probably take up to uh, maybe up to two weeks to, to culture out. Okay. So um, somehow the mouse feeder cells is heterogeneous and you know the, the, the complex cell to cell signaling we cannot still fully dissect and understand. And so um, and that is why there are some groups that are still insistent on using the mouse feeder cells um, because they can maintain the epidermal stem cell in culture to improve. I say improve to ensure to ensure that they have the engraftment, but unfortunately, it's only restricted to all only to those severe cases, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Arvind. Um, let me see if we have more questions. Yep, yeah, uh, we do have another question, and maybe, maybe uh, with one more point that I may want to you know uh, again, uh, having heard your presentation, that I would like the audience members to understand right is that the technology advancements that you have achieved through replacement of the mouse feeder cells with the potentially the laminin layer is really there's a huge uh, savings in terms of time and cost that you require to grow the mouse feeder cells for it to be prepared for manufacturing versus laminins, as you rightly mentioned, is just coating it. And you know within a few hours time frame you can start to uh, manufacture and put on the cells for growing your skin cells. So, so that's something to take note. So on top of um, the doubling time that you, experience in terms of the skin cells, absolutely. There's also a time saved by removing or replacing the mouse feeder with the with the laminin. Uh, if you wanted to add any more points, uh, Alvin, to that. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, the, the laminin that we're using is uh, a recombinant, fully human, all right? So I, I, I think, of course, that will 
uh, what Sudipto says uh, is that um, really we can bypass a lot of um, labor, I would say, and also a lot of uh, regulatory, um, so-called, to meet a lot of regulatory requirements because mouse feeder cells, right? They are mouse, and that's and that's why they call xenogenic, all right. So, really, the the kind of um, oversight and the kind of uh, checks are more stringent in a sense, and also the patient who actually receive this xenograph, okay, in in the US, they are not supposed to even donate blood because it's a it's deemed a safety issue. So you can see that okay, using this laminate system because it's fully human, okay, might mitigate some of these issues, lah. Yeah, right. Um, I think that's a very, uh, very, you know, uh, clear point to bring across. And I think we should really start to look at technologies that can start to grow. I mean, really, um, uh, Elvin's technology right demonstrates that how we can cut short the manufacturing time and increase the cost and uh, in reduce the cost and increase the efficiency of such processes that and really look forward to your clinical trial in the years to come. Um, with that, uh, if I would like to move to the next question, have you considered 3D printing of these skin allografts? What is the potential of IPS technology to replace primary cells for clinical use? Uh, I think this is a very broad question. Yes, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So yeah, I, I've been asked many times about uh, 3D printing as well. Now, so 3D printing, you see, um, there are two parts to the skin. Now. So if you remember just now, I have the dermal template and also I have the epithelial layer, which are made up of live cells. Okay, so in terms of, I, I think it's possible to do um, 3D printing of the dermal template, all right? Um, because it's, it's, it's extracellular matrix anyway. Okay, you, you want to embed with a bit of skin fibroblast, it's fine, or blood vessels. Um, but really the technology is still not mature enough. And so you can see, even today, most of the commercial products out there Okay, don't, don't use 3D printing. Okay, so in terms of 3D printing, the epidermal layer, because these are live cells, right? So if live cells going through a narrow nozzle also might be detrimental to the cells, especially stem cells. They are very um, sensitive to you know, external environments. Okay, and the other thing is the cells still need to grow. So unless you grow enough, epidermal cells to do the 3D printing, which means you are just laying the cells over or dispensing the cells over, and you still need the cells to adhere and eventually so-called engraft and, you know, and, and take. So you, um, you are actually also um, so-called not, uh, so -called not improving the process. In fact, it's not as efficient. So if I already have a sheet of cells in readiness, I can just put onto the wound and quickly wait for the cells to engraft. Because when you do 3D printing, you are just dispensing them out there only. It's just like you're seeding cells. You, you, you go, I mean, and cells need time to engraft. And don't forget, even if you use 3D printing, can you 3D, can you print out the basement membrane? The basement membrane is so thin, and how are you going to print it out? So it's a highly complex structure, which a lot of people just think that, oh, I can just 3D print. It's, that is, a, I would say, it's a misconception in a sense. Right. So uh, maybe an extrapolation of your uh, suggestion, right? If you are talking about 3D printing and doing it in very small scale, uh, one immediate application that comes to mind is probably for you know various types of uh, in vitro testing models, right? You know, if you wanted to use it, but uh, truly I understand your viewpoint that to achieve a clinical scale 3D printed graft, uh, that does still require much uh, technological advancement and much R&D before it's fully realized. Um, what is the potential of IPSC technology to replace primary cells for clinical use? Um, maybe I'll take a step first in this, okay? <laughs> then I'll hand over the time to you. IPSC, as you know, we know in multiple areas, uh, specifically in Japan, there's a lot of efforts that has been made to bring IPSC cells, but yet the clinical safety and efficacy of it remains to be proven. So there's a number of efforts taking place. Uh, it is still too early to say that it can fully replace. Uh, that's a viewpoint that I would like to share, but I'm sure our audience members will have uh, 
maybe a more in-depth understanding of this topic. But at this point in time, whether it's for skin technology or others, it's still yet to be fully realized because of safety issues, because of uh, issues pertaining to the conversion success rate. So after you have made the iPSC, how many iPSC can actually be converted to the desired differentiated cell type that you're looking at? with the right functionality, and most importantly, with the right number that you require for it to be used in clinical applications, right? So that, that's something that, you know, uh, it still continues to be an area of growth and improvement for this field in the next few years. Uh, Alvin, I just wanted to highlight to our audience number one point, right? That the technology, whether it's the conventional technology or the new technology that you're developing based on laminins, right? And there are a few other competing technologies in the overseas market that you have shown in one of your prior slides, right? Uh, just want to appreciate, get this appreciation from our audience member that in fact, none of these technologies are locally available within Singapore and not even so in the region. And in fact, uh, SGH Burns Unit, where Alvin does many of his work, uh, along with his other appointments, happens to be the regional referral center with the right set of expertise, infrastructure, and clinical know-how to deal with uh, deep level burn, uh, burn wounds, right? So, so you know, uh, developing this technology here will definitely greatly impact our local population, but at the same time, we will have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact in the region as well. So with that, uh, maybe moving forward to the last uh, question that we uh, I can Sorry, uh, Sudhito, maybe I just add on about yes, the IPSC. Yes. So um, again, uh, IPSC typically is derived from skin. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to different, de differentiate the, I, the, the cells are taken from the skin cell to, you know, to IPSC and then differentiate it back to skin. So, so that's the other thing that I, I just want to mention. Uh, because for skin, we can just take a skin biopsy and we can just grow it immediately. So that's no point having these additional steps, which actually also, and the, the de precisely the de differentiation process still has a lot of regulatory roadblocks and a lot of safety issues. Agreed, okay, Alvin. Th thanks for covering that point. Um, uh, okay, to move to the next question. I'll move on to the next question, yeah. Alvin. Okay. okay, so just wondering, uh, did you test this novel cell culture system on other epithelial cells, like ocular surface epithelial cell and oral mucosa cell? Um, we haven't really done that, but we, we wanted to try on the oral, uh, oral mucosa epithelial cells, but um, with a dental center. So, but we haven't really moved much on that, but we have sort of started a little bit on that project. And um, I think in terms of the cornea epithelial cells, um, I think there's also a Japanese group that is working on it, but they are using the smaller fragment of um, the, the laminin. So the laminin that I'm using together with cow is the full fragment, the entire protein. Okay, but there, there are people who are using so-called the active domain of the protein fragments um, so that to, to culture corneal epithelial cells. That's that one I'm aware. Yeah. Thank you, Alvin. Um, trying to look out. We have almost answered all the questions so far. Um, Maybe would you like to share something to wrap up your presentation and this session? Okay, so I mean, um, I just to I mean, this is also following on the three D printing question. Uh. So some people, so if you just now really remember that I, I showed the spawning of all the different tissue engineer products over the years, and people are also developing uh, bi layered skin, so they have both the epithelial and the dermal component uh, with the skin fibroblast. And I've also been asked a lot of, many times, why are we not advancing enough? Why, why, why am I still so backward, just still working on the epithelial layer? Right, um, one of the reason is this, like, because I, you know, those people who are doing the bilayered skin, you need a lot of time to get the cells to grow and to be fully functional in vitro or ex vivo outside the body. And it's not actually the it's not the perfect incubator, I would say. Okay, for to, to manufacture or 3D printing or 3D print all these kind of products. Ultimately, I feel that it's our human body that is the best incubator. And so, like, why do I why do we put the dermal skin allograph or dermal template, artificial dermal template on the wound bed first and let it vascularize? It's because you let the patient's own body 
you know, populate it. I mean, the, the, I mean once body cells populate this template, while you grow the, the epithelial cells, which the, the patient does, which the patient does not have time to, to grow in vivo, right? So that's where we grow the epithelial cells outside or ex vivo, and then put it back and let it engraft and quickly close up the wound. And so the other thing that I want to quick um, to also highlight is that engraftment is different from wound healing. Engraftment is, I mean, okay, because I'm not doing engraftment, I can say it's of a higher order than wound, rest, uh, wound, wound healing. Because if to engraft, you need to have stem cells. Wound healing can only can mean that you can put something to stimulate wound, the, the endogenous cells on the body to close up, to, to proliferate faster. Okay, so it's very different. And because of the nature of the injury that we are treating, we have to make sure that you know our cell culture system is on the tip top condition so that engraftment will happen. So I think that's that's all I have to share. Uh, maybe I will I will do a quick wrap up, then hand over the time to Aisha. So uh, thank you, Alvin, very much for sharing. You know your great work that you have been doing in this space. Uh, really, I think our local community will benefit from some of these work as it comes to clinical trials, and subsequently, you know, we look forward to having such. Uh, skin craft products hopefully approved in our local ecosystem. Uh, with that, I would like to firstly thank all the audience members uh, for attending this session. Uh, please do reach out to Actress, uh, it's www.actress.sg if you have any queries or you know any kind of support you require with regards to cell therapy process development manufacturing. And uh, as you can see, we are part of the Chris family. Um, you can check out the website www chris.sg uh, brings together a whole set of capabilities uh, from uh, clinical trial facilitation and so on and so forth uh, to enable your research. Please do reach out as well. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Alvin. Thank you, everybody. And over to you, Aisha, to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, Professor Thanks. Thanks for the And thank you, Dr. Sadiq Jomari. We have come to the end of our lecture. On behalf of Actress, we would like to thank you for your time today and we hope to see you again in our next lecture on the 11th of April. As a sign off, we will be asked to answer a short survey questions pertaining to the webinar. We'll appreciate your feedback as it helps us to be better at what we do. So once again, thank you everyone and have a good afternoon.